Good morning. so much for many blessings that you've allowed me to have, for this church to have, for all of us in this building. And Lord, I pray that you watch over us and care for us for the rest of this week. 
I pray the Lord to lead me the way that you want me to go, not the way I want to go. I love you. I need you in my life. Please forgive me where I've seen the failure. Amen. 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 Thanks.
week. And I'll forgive my use of a tautology there. But let's just recognize that for a church that averages, uh, well, or averaged uh, pre-COVID 100 in worship, to have two deaths in the same week is painful. We have two families that are grieving as we celebrated the life of Margaret Tooley and David Bradenkamp this week. Their families are, yes, celebrating the life, but grieving the loss, as we all are. These two members of our church have been so faithful and, and so giving. And so we want to remember uh, those families and ourselves as we grieve their loss also. Uh, we need to be lifting up those who are having procedures coming up. Uh, we know uh, tomorrow we're praying for KJ. Uh, she has her surgery on her neck. Tomorrow also, uh, Patsy Flicker is having a heart cath. Um, it is, oftentimes we see that and they, they kind of call that, can be a, a, a less serious procedure, but in her case, uh, the dye that they're using quite possibly can cause her kidneys to shut down. Uh, and so we are praying for her recovery. We're praying that that does not happen. Uh, that would truly be God showing off uh, should she come out of that without uh, needing dialysis. We're also lifting up Val as she prepares for her surgery in a week. There's a lot going on that doesn't have either COVID-19 or Christmas attached to it. Funny thing is, our lives continue. Yes. And so as we are gathered together today, and man, I can't, I'm, here's the, here's why I always struggle with naming you, because I'm gonna start looking around like, man, we need to be praying for Tammy, and Tammy, what you're going through, sister, we're with you, and you know, you know, be praying for her. Uh, we got word just before service started, Norm uh, Revlet popped in just to let us know. He took Jody Revlet to the emergency room last night. She's still in the hospital right now. Uh, we've got people that are recovering that we're glad to see. We have a God who sees it all and is not overwhelmed. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we recognize within us that when we have weeks such as this, that it's hard for us to process everything. It's hard for us to recognize how much we've truly lost. It's hard for us to recognize that, Father, there are people still getting a common cold. There are still people dealing with blood sugar issues and blood pressure issues and heart issues and kidney issues and all of these other things. And when we start making lists of all of the different requests that we have, and Father, there are some that we have collectively as a group. And there are some requests that are on the hearts of individuals as they know people and are related to people that the rest of us do not know. Yet we are called to weep with those who are weeping and at the same time rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And we're not good at that. But you are. You are a God who at the same moment can be shedding tears with the family that has lost a parent as you are rejoicing with the family that has new birth. And in the midst of all of these physical things that are going on in our lives, you are still a God who is bringing people from spiritual death to eternal life. You are still causing the gospel to go out and to be spread. Even if the borders are closed to our missionaries going in, 
Father, your word is already there and living and active and working in the lives of people who need to know who Jesus is and what he has done for each and every one of us. So Father, we pray in this moment that you would continue to allow us to lay all of our requests at your feet. Father, the things that I mentioned and the things that I forgot or for one reason or other did not say today. Hear the heart and mind of each person in this room. And Father, as there are thousands of congregations right now gathered in worship, receive all of our worship, all of our glory, all of the honor, all of the praise unto your great name. For Father, you are worthy of all of it and so much more. Thank you for using our hands to serve you. We might feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are in need of clothing, visit those who are lonely, use us, but receive the glory. For we praise, pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Amen. Let's all stand.
chapter 2, beginning in verse number 8, we find these words. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, I've been hearing that ever since I can remember. I, I, I cannot remember a time in my life where there went by a single Christmas that I did not hear those words. And part of the reason I can say that with confidence is because it was a family tradition in, in my household that on Christmas Eve, every Christmas Eve, without exception, my father read Luke chapter 2 to us before any presents were opened, before anything was done. This is what started it off. 
and I totally stole that from my family. And so even if we had a Christmas Eve service here and I preached and did all the stuff you do on Christmas Eve services, I would go home and listen again. You're, you're going to hear Luke chapter 2. But can I be honest, when I was younger, it frustrated me to no end whenever the angels would declare peace on earth. And I grew up hearing it out of the King James Version. And so it's worded differently. I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. In the, in the King James Version, it just says, peace on earth and goodwill to men. And we've been singing that today. We've been declaring that today. We've been putting it out there. And I would hear that every single year. And not one of those years had gone by where there had truly been peace on earth. Do you know every year there are wars going on? This world has not experienced peace on earth. And I would be frustrated by that when I was younger because if the Bible is true, how do I take the message of the angels? And reconcile that with the history books and, to be honest with you, my own eyes. It's the message we hear. And this year, if any year, has not been a peaceful year. I mean, we blamed everything on 2020, but the reality is that the date really has nothing to do about it. It's just been rough. There have been race riots that we have seen. There have been civil wars going on in nations. There are more people being killed right now in Afghanistan than in any other conflict anywhere else in the world. Right now, Afghanistan is anything but peace on earth. And it's not just wars. Bitterness between people in America is at an all-time high. Seeing the way people have been divided over color of skin, political party, religion, a tweet. I mean, you name an issue, there are people out there fighting about it right now. I mean, we can't even all get along on whether or not it's a gif or a gif. I mean, it, we, we want to fight over everything. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Don't worry about it. It's not important to say. <laughs> Yet we're gathered together at Christmas. And a major theme at Christmas and the message of the angels is peace on earth. Yet the earth has not experienced total peace since Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, we're still going to sing songs about peace, just like the ones that we've sung today. And in fact, it's not just the songs that are in our hymn books. The, the world out there knows that there's supposed to be a connection between this holiday called Christmas and this idea of peace. Even people who reject God that write Christmas songs, and yes, there are the people that have rejected God that have also written Christmas. Some of you may have heard of a guy named John Lennon. Uh, you know, he's... Not real big on the Christian scene, you know, but, you know, those of you who know the Beatles know what I'm talking about. He wrote a Christmas song called Happy Christmas. You probably, so this is Christmas. What have you done? It's lovely. It's pretty. And halfway through the song, when the, when the chorus starts going, there's a, a desk camp of children singing in the background. He doesn't sing it. The children sing it in the background. And what are they singing? And they just keep singing that over and over. And the reality is, war is not over, even though I want it over. But the world understands there's supposed to be some kind of connection between Christmas and peace. 
How does that work? Well, first, the only way we can understand this is we have to reconcile that the angels proclaimed a qualified peace. Now, here's where I have to address that, the, the King James issue. Believe it or not, the difference in your King James translation and the majority of other translations is all over one letter sigma. The, the text that the King James were written off of had a word where there was no sigma at the end of it, which meant you had to translate it one way. But as we found much older manuscripts and a lot more manuscripts than were available in 1611, all of those manuscripts had the sigma at the end of the word. So the difference is whether or not it is goodwill to all men or goodwill to whom God is pleased or upon whom his favor rests. It's the direction that's pointed is all down to that letter sigma. It's so much so that the New King James Version as it has a study Bible actually says in it, I want to make sure that I get this right, it's qualified where it says the oldest manuscripts and let's see, nope, I'm reading the wrong part there. It notes on verse 14, the translation does not reflect the modern Greek manuscripts. But that's what we've heard for so long. And so it's still, it's in our heads. It's still there, but we have to recognize that the peace that the angels were proclaiming was not a universal peace for all people at that time. Even Jesus himself made sure that people understood that his coming into the world was not bringing a universal peace. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus recognized that his advent into the world was not going to bring a peace where there would be no more fighting. In fact, his very presence in the world was going to cause fights even within families. And there are people in this room that have experienced those wars. You've been around the holiday table where you attempted to do what I beg you to do every year. Now, make sure you keep Jesus central and make sure, you know, if you're with your family, that sometimes you share the gospel with them. This is the opportunity that you have. And you took me at my word and you brought up Jesus and you received the smackdown that comes when you bring up Jesus in polite company. You've been brokenhearted as you've seen your children walk away and have fights and arguments with you as you continue to strive to point them to Jesus and they just don't want to be bothered with that. So they keep the peace by every once in a while showing up on Mother's Day just to kind of, you know, keep the peace. This is why we often use Norman Rockwell's family drawings and not our own, because they're much prettier than what we would come up with. There are families that cannot act civilly toward one another, and the heart of that conflict is Jesus Christ himself. So we still have our race riots. We still have people armed with machine guns and swords. We still have religion going against religion. And can we just be honest and acknowledge the fact that there have been wars in this world that have been waged in the name of Jesus that have brought anything but peace? So when the angels make their proclamation, peace on earth, 
it is a qualified piece. So who is it for me? And can I tell you this is why I now love the message of the angels that once I never understood. Because second, we have to recognize that there is a perfect peace now between believers and God. Amen. The peace that the angels was talking about hasn't happened this way. But it has happened perfectly this way. Ephesians chapter 2. Typically when we say that, you're ready for those verses. For my grace, you're saved, you're faith. We're, we're ready for that. We often stop after verse 10. You know, we're God's workmanship created for good works that he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. And we stop there. What if we just went just a few verses more? We would hear this. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11, verses 11 through 16. Paul wrote, therefore, because we're saved, through Jesus, through faith in Jesus. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace it might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility do you see there that Paul is saying that the cross of Jesus Christ was the final shot in the war between you and God you were born in your sin you were born totally hostile to God, but God knew you were going to be born that way. And get this, he already reconciled you through the cross of Jesus Christ. He'd already done, the war was over. You just didn't know it yet. You were busy trying to keep the war off. And I don't know, God was probably up there laughing at you going, oh, oh child. Don't know what I've done for you yet, but you will. You will see what my son has done for you. And not only that, that helps us reconcile that there is a new peace that was made this way. You see, there were two by there were Gentiles and there were Jews. But the cross of Christ grabbed both camps and brought them together into one new body, the church. And so now, I have the ability, through Christ, through all the forgiveness that he's poured into me for my sinful self, to allow that to spill out, that I might forgive you when you wronged me, and thank goodness that you might forgive me when I wronged you. That there might be a peace between us, that to be honest, some of you, if we met out there and it wasn't in here, we probably would never talk to each other. I'm scared to look at any guy for too long because they'll think I'm talking about that. <laughs> but the reality is, as Christ died on the cross, he reconciled God and man, and he made it possible for us to be reconciled to one another. That while there are race riots out there, there do not have to be race riots in here. That while out there Democrats and Republicans can be fighting and arguing and all of that, but when Democrats and Republicans come in here, they can sit side by side with one another. That mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws cannot be at war, but love one another. There was 
a man some of you may have heard of and, and know by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He's going to put his picture up here in case you want to see him because he's got a beautiful beard. <laughs> In July of 1861, his wife died after her dress caught on fire. He tried to put the flames out and himself was severely burned. She passed away, but he was burned so badly he could not even attend the funeral. He grew that marvelous beard to cover scarring all over his face that he received as he was trying to save his wife. Two years later, his son Charles left home without telling anyone to go and join and fight in the Civil War. Henry finally gave permission that he could enlist. Uh, people that knew his son Charles uh, kind of contacted him and said, hey, is this okay with you? And it wasn't, but he gave his permission anyways. On November 27, 1863, Charlie got shot through the left shoulder and the bullet exited from under his right shoulder blade. It had traveled across his back and nicked his spine before going out the other side. He traveled home. It was home in December. Upon hearing that his son might die, then he heard that, well, he, he, he's probably going to live, but he's going to be paralyzed. But then, well, he might not be fully paralyzed, but he's going to be a long time in healing. The now widowed Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had a real conflict on Christmas. He saw the country ripping itself apart. Think about it, 1863 was right in the middle of the Civil War. And he was watching it. He'd seen his wife die. He saw his son now struggling. He had four or five other children that he was trying to raise on his own. And on Christmas morning of 1863, he could hear bells in Cambridge that began ringing, and his mind went to Luke chapter 2, verse 14, in the angels saying, Peace on earth. And there was a great conflict that was going on him, and in that conflict of trying to reconcile the message of the angels. Reconcile that with everything that was going on in his life and in his nation. He wrote a poem that was called Christmas Bells. We sang part of that poem just a little while ago. You see, we took that poem and we made the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. But it doesn't seem as pretty the way he wrote it as we just sang it. What we've done is we've taken two stanzas out and rearranged a couple so that we don't have to stay in the mess very long. I want you to hear his poem the way it was originally written. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet. The words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells, more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. 
You see, we take the bitterness out. But the reality is at Christmas time, there are times we feel that bitterness as we look around in the world and we're, where's the peace? I don't see it. There's war going on. But the message of the Christ child that came for you and for me is louder than any gunfire. It's louder than any rioting. It's louder than any family member. It's louder than anything this world can offer because the reality is the Christ child came and was born and he brought peace between you and God if you would but believe that he ended the war the day that he died on the cross for your sins. His poem is written just like the Psalms are written as David cries out and he sees everything is going wrong and he's about to die and things are falling apart but at the end of the Psalms there's always that but I trust in you. And that's what I ask you today. I'm not saying is your life perfect. I'm not saying that you experience great peace this Christmas. I'm saying, do you recognize that the true peace that is offered to you came in Jesus Christ, his birth, and his crucifixion for your sins? Regardless of what the rest of the world will proclaim, will you listen to that? Let's pray again. You are not dead, O oh Lord. You do not sleep. The wrong will fail. The right will prevail. And we will have peace. Because your son died for us. The perfect sacrifice for the enemy. You bought us with his blood. You have purified us, sanctified us, and you've made us one with people that otherwise we would not know or get along with. Instead, you've made us family. Father, let us believe this message. And receive the benefit that comes from being at peace. Amen. Amen. If you don't have that peace today, as we sing this song, I want to invite you to come and, and share that with me. And I want to pray with you and show you how to have a genuine peace this Christmas. Let's stand together as we sing.
done for you. If you don't know that, don't leave until you do. Now, we are not going to be dismissing by roles. We know there, there's sometimes I forget to bring it up afterwards, and then all chaos comes, and some people know about it, some people don't. This is what's going to happen. If you are scared of people gathering, then as soon as I get that visit, you, you dark out. I mean, go. Or you just kind of chill a little while until the crowd kind of disperses, and then you go in your. I'm going to trust you guys to make the decision on when to go and when not to go. So that's what we're going to dismiss. But let's receive the, some are already holding up. Let's, let's receive the benediction together. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, we give you praise for bringing peace on earth. We recognize, Father, that not everyone is at peace right now. Lord, we are reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so now, Father, as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen.